So welcome everyone to the new episode of uh, Beyond Phrenology. Today we have with us uh, Nico Hexopoulos. Uh, Nico is a full professor of organismal biology and anatomy at the University of Chicago. He's also on the Committee of Computational Neuroscience. Uh, and he runs a fascinating lab, which is focused on uh, uh, mostly brain machine interfaces. It does a lot of work with monkeys, uh, where electrodes are put in monkeys' brain and uh, they record from those electrodes uh, while monkeys are moving, uh, reaching out for things and using tools. Uh, and the idea is to develop machines, uh, brain machine interfaces for people who are body locked, as, as well as to understand uh, how the brain controls movements uh, and extend those findings uh, into different clinical domains. Uh, so Nico, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So, uh, as uh, as you remember, I did visit your lab uh, in 2018, uh, and I was fascinated by it. And I uh, wanted to do a postdoc there, and of course, we tried our best, uh, and then things changed. Uh, and I was fascinated by your work. Uh, and one of the things which I found a little different with your approach compared to others was that uh, you are very agnostic to uh, theories about the brain. You are more into uh, you're more pragmatic about how much we can interpret uh, based on what we record. And when I read your papers, uh, they don't over speculate. Uh, they remain, uh, they, they they respect the mysteries of the brain as much as they respect the uh, the insights which we get, you know, when we record from it. Yes. So, uh, so I want to discuss with you to begin with, you know, with, with your approach. Uh, like, how yeah. are you able to manage, uh, you know, such... Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean... First of all, I'd like to add to what you said at the beginning. Uh, yeah. I would say, for me, my my biggest motivation is is not brain machine interfaces. It's really trying to understand how the brain works um, at the level of populations of neurons. You know, so we have the technology now to record from large groups of neurons. Uh, we believe that any function in the brain, whether it's perceptual, uh, cognitive, or or motor, it involves large groups of neurons. And so my interest has always been, you know, how do these neurons work together to create a function? And so I, I'm a more of a basic scientist. I have fallen into this area of brain machine interfaces, which is more, in some level, more more engineering related, I guess, or more practical. Um, although even in the context of brain machine interfaces, I'm interested in what we can learn about the brain. Uh, in addition to helping people with severe motor disabilities. So that's, and in fact, I wrote a paper on, on, on the science of brain machine interfaces. Like what can we learn scientifically and, and, and explore the function of the brain using a brain computer or brain machine interface um, as a tool, as opposed to a a solution to a problem, uh, a, a clinical problem. Um, but of course, I'm interested in the clinical problem as well, and and um, and so uh, yeah, I mean, as far as the mystery of the brain, it's yeah, for me, I. I do not have any theoretical framework, really. I, um, I mean, there are a few things that I are kind of axiomatic, I, I suppose, uh, and um, or ideas that most people, I think, in the field agree on. That you know, um, that for example, the the unit of information transfer or information representation is the spike, is the action potential. That, uh, you know, that's how, that's sort of the level that, 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 that that's the, uh, the basic currency that neurons use to communicate. And, uh, and, and, and also generally it's, it's the frequency at which these neurons fire that carry the information. Uh, but aside from that, you know, there's not, yeah, I don't have a grand theory uh, yet. And, and as you know, my focus is more on, on, on how the motor areas of the brain, particularly the cortex 
control movements of the arm and the hand. Uh, that's that's what really excites me. And I think it was it was because you know people have asked me why why that um, why that area why motor control uh, mm -hmm. and I think it's comes from my background. I, I I studied physics in college and I I think I was just. I like the fact that you could measure these things. Um, you could measure movement, uh, whereas it's harder to measure what an animal is thinking or what an animal is perceiving. Right. Uh, whereas you can measure. And so I think that's what appealed to me, to the, the motor area. I was also interested in um, when I was a kid, well, and a, a young adult, I should say. Uh, I was interested in robotics and and how you could get a robot to to dance, for example. Yeah. To give the kind of fluid mo motion that you see in a dancer, and and at, at least at the time, and even today, I mean, you don't see robots doing the kind of giving you the kind of fluid motion that you see in 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 animals and in humans. Uh, so that. That appealed to me. Yeah. So, uh, so did your work finally uh, reveal something about the fluidity of the motion? Uh, you know, to the extent that uh, it was fascinating you to begin with. Uh, no, I mean we haven't resolved that issue. Uh, no, um, although we are doing experiments now, uh, looking at motor motor skill acquisition. You know. Uh, and looking at the learning process and and how, you know, ideally, you, yeah, you want to look at lar many parts of the brain, which we, we which I can't do, but at least uh, so the focus for me is looking at the at the motor cortex or sensory cortex, somatosensory cortex, and looking at how those areas change as that fluidity builds up to see if we can l learn something about. Get, get some insights as to how that fluidity happens uh, in the biological system. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I guess what the thing I learned, again, uh, yeah, in the context of brain computer interfaces, I think what we're learning, what I've come to realize is that the role of sensory feedback is critical for that fluidity in part um but there are many re there are many aspects that improve fluidity but but the role of vision and the role of proprioception uh the sense of where your limb is in space and how it's how it's moving that sense which is a sense you never really study in high school it's like a it's like a uh, the mysterious sense it's not one of the primary senses you learn about in school, yeah. but it's it's a key sense. And I think that's a key part. And we have not actually, we're, we're thinking about it, like how would we incorporate that in a brain computer interface, but we haven't done it yet. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so one of the reasons that even like when you look at brain computer interfaces, like actual robots controlling uh, by the brain, which you yourself had, right, with monkeys, uh, the Nature Communications article. So, yes. uh, so you think that because there's not a, a back and forth flow of information, that's why uh, the rigidity comes in. There's no kind of dampening, right, of those uh, movements. Yeah, I, I think part of, part of, yeah, I mean, the animal could only see. He so said he only yeah. had vision to yeah. guide his movement, um, but he could not feel the mo movement he was generating. And I think that plays a big role. I mean, of course, there were other reasons. I mean, yeah. uh, first of all, we weren't recording from enough neurons to control the device. The device was also a mechanical, I mean, a, well, you know, electromechanical, you know, it was a, a industrial robot. Well, not industrial, but it was a, it was a, 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 a robot that was driven, but with cables um, yeah. that had, you know, limited degrees of freedom. Um, you know, the other aspect that I think will play a role in fluidity is trying to 
develop a an actuator that's more like the the natural arm the or or the natural musculoskeletal skeletal system so have actuators that are like more like muscles that act like springs yeah um that uh as opposed to just uh torque uh motors or uh you know yeah things like that so how do you uh, did you end up you know having uh, such a specialized uh, you know, uh, feel in your science and the lab. I mean, uh, this is not something which we start with, right? There are very specific places, even in the United States, uh, who work on these areas. So if you think from a, a student's perspective, the exposure to these kind of technologies and these kind of research labs is very limited. Yes. So how did I get, you want me to start from the beginning or? Uh... Yeah, sure. <laughs> Why not? I mean, yeah, again, so, so, uh, I guess it started in graduate school. I was interested in motor control, uh, but I had got my PhD in cognitive science. Uh, and so it was not related to the brain per se. I mean, I didn't, I never saw a brain and never stuck electrode in a brain. I was working with human subjects, uh, studying uh, actually rhythmic movements in, in human subjects. And, um, and and the question I I, I was uh, looking into there was how how come humans when they when they generate rhythmic movements and and that applies to animals in general like when they locomote for example they they choose a preferred kind of a a preferred frequency in which they locomote yeah where does that come from you know why do they choose that preferred oscillation frequency and it has and i wanted you know to um you know and i i thought well and and from the literature it was clear that you know maybe it has something to do with a resonant frequency of of the limb the physics of the limb has a certain resonant frequency based on the mass and its moment of inertia and and so um so i studied humans uh doing these rhythmic movements with their arms and then developed a model, a computer model where I had a, a nervous system. Again, it was just com computational, like a very simple um, oscillatory circuit in it simulated on a computer that would generate commands to a physical limb. Uh, again, simulated uh, and, and it would it'd drive the limb to start oscillating. And of course, it would, the limb would oscillate based on the commands at any frequency that was dictated by the nervous system oscillator. But as soon as I provided feedback, uh, like kind of proprioceptive feedback yeah. from the limb back to the, the, the neural oscillator, then, then together, the, as a whole, the system uh settled on a resin on on this res resonant frequency and so so i i wanted to argue that it was like the coupling of the nervous system with the the mechanics of the limb bi-directionally that okay. resulted in this resonant frequency that's chosen and, and that's what i showed in simulation i then tried to but it was not successful i tried to then recruit patients that lacked proprioception i recruited them in fact and and had yeah. them choose to make ry rhythmic movements and they it, it was not successful in that they they chose a uh, they chose a resonant frequency also i was hoping they would choose frequencies that were not yeah. resonant like but I, it may have their i don't know perhaps their injury was not complete or their their disorder and they were take you know they had been taking medications as well so i'm not really sure why it didn't succeed but yeah but well, there could be alternate uh, possibilities of feedback in the mechanical uh yeah. you know structure of the body as well yeah so that's how i started um okay. and then um you know i was interested in this dancing robot idea and then um then learned about uh 
autonomous robots like insect robots, uh, particularly. And, and I was fascinated by how very simple you could build these very simple insect robots with simple nervous systems and that could generate very complex behaviors. That's what I thought that was super cool. And so I ended up doing a postdoc in an insect lab, working with uh, locusts. And uh, that's how I started in, but that was a postdoc, but I started doing yeah. neuro, neuro, neuroscience, recording from their brains and nervous systems. And, and that's how I got into neuro, neuroscience. And then from insects, I went to non-human primates. Uh, and uh, and that involved a second postdoc uh, at Brown University, and uh, and and that's at that time when I was hired, my mentor John Donahue uh, had already had just begun a a collaboration with a biomedical engineer at Utah who had developed um, an array of electrodes that you could record from populations of neurons chronically and that's and so we did the first recordings in in a non-human primate with these arrays of electrodes and now we could chronically record for for in fact sometimes for years uh from populations of neurons in the motor cortex while the monkeys uh, engaged in various behaviors uh that we had like like video games and so we could and then that led to well Okay, with these populations, can we decode what the motion that that is predict what the monkey is doing based on the population of neurons? And we show that we can do that. And then, um, and then that led to us saying, well, maybe this this could be used for for a brain computer interface. Uh, and that led me down the road to starting a company. Uh, with John Donahue and two other colleagues, uh, and with the goal to implement this in humans with severe disabilities such as spinal cord injury, um, ALS, and brainstem stroke. And even though the ultimately the company was not a success commercially, uh, it was sort of ahead of its time and. And it required a lot more funding from uh, you know, venture capitalists that we, you know, we got some money, but not enough. And, but it was, this, uh, I think it was a success scientifically because we demonstrated in these humans using the same array that I had, we had first imp tried in a, in a non-human primate, we implemented it in, uh, implanted it in the human and we showed that even though they had these chronic long-term disabilities like spinal cord injury, we could still have them, uh, we could still record from brain signals that were active in the motor cortex of these individuals. They could think about some motor action and these cells would start firing in different, different patterns. We could decode those signals and, and actually have them control a cursor on a computer screen in real time. Yeah. And that's, so that's, uh, this company was called Cyberkinetics, um, and that happened in the early 2000s. Um, and um, we implanted four subjects. We got FDA approval to do this clinical trial. That was a big ordeal um of course as you can imagine and, and then um we implemented it and it worked yeah and yeah no, no that's, that's not that's, yeah especially that's how approval. i got to it yeah yeah the fda, FDA approval yeah. was a big deal yes yeah so uh, so you and, are uh, so that was that was like uh, pretty much ahead of time you know we are talking about two decades back uh in terms of approval and in terms of uh people being and and since then there have been a lot of demonstrations, a similar kind, right, from uh, from labs uh, across the United States. Uh, exactly. So on that note, uh, so so now 
these things are more in fancy and in lay people's mind given that uh, you have uh, billionaires and millionaires now talking more about these brain machine interface uh, recently right and there are a lot of startups now uh, yes with uh, with very uh, i would say uh, bigger promises uh, much bigger promises right uh, often uh, often uh, uh, fictional in some ways so so yes. what do you what do you think of those i mean so for example uh, uh, so for example one of those is neuralink and whenever i talk about neuralink and i try to be a little pragmatic about it or you know other similar kind of stuff i'm told that uh, this one guy's uh, ambitions are so big that i feel little about myself and that's why uh, all that pragmatism comes out of feeling small from somebody's success you know and you are just stopped with that, that ad hominem attack, attack right it has become very hard to even talk pragmatically about brain machine interfaces at least beyond academic circles uh, those who uh, beyond those who actually do this kind of work or understand yeah. Uh, yeah what do you think of the reality of brain machine interfaces where we are right now uh, and where we will get to in a few decades and what kind of promises uh, these promises well i you know i think I mean, there's not, yeah, cons there's no conceptual obstacle to getting these yeah. to work. Uh, we're not missing. There's no missing link, missing understanding. Uh, it's really basically an engineering problem. I think the way I see it, I see, um, you know, I mean, even though, yeah, even though our focus is mainly on on the decoding algorithms, the algorithms that translate brain activity into into motion commands, that is pretty well, it's pretty mature, I think. And uh, yeah, I mean, there could be improvements there, but I think the key improvements, key things that need to be improved are an, a device that can be implant, implanted in the brain that could, that could record from enough neurons larger groups of neurons than we currently can do and that could last for a long time that is we can record from brain cells for maybe a decade at least uh so that's more of a like a biomaterials engineering problem finding the right material that can uh that you can put in the brain that doesn't result in a for, a major foreign body reaction uh, that where the, the the brain tries to you know encapsulate it and and once it's encapsulated uh, with um, glial cells, then you can you stop recording good quality signals. Um, and so I mean, I think an improvement on the interface the the actual implant is one thing. And then also, um, well, then there are two. Actually, there are two other things that need to be improved. Uh, and then there's the the output on the output, the actuator, the the device that yes. the subject is going to control. As I said earlier in our discussion, I think a, an actuator that's more natural, that's that maybe mimics. Um, if you, if you're talking about controlling a, a a limb, I'm I'm talking about. Of course, if you're controlling, if you're trying to do communication on a computer. You don't need to control a limb. You just need to control a, a, a mouse, a cursor. But if you're trying to control a limb, you need yeah. a device that's more, I think, more natural with more like naturalistic yeah. muscle. like Especially if we want to grasp as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and with with multiple degrees of freedom. And, uh, and then... And then the third issue, which we're start we're working on right now, is again, if you want that fluidity and that dexterity, is you want sensory feedback. Proprioception and in the context of the hand in particular, you want tactile feedback. You want to be yeah. able to feel what you're grabbing. Right. Uh, and and there may there are demonstrations that show that. If you lack either proprioception or tactile feedback, your motor uh, function is disabled, is affected dramatically. So, 
So what we're doing now at the University of Chicago is uh, trying to incorporate tactile feedback by electrically stimulating the somatosensory cortex to evoke artificial tactile percepts. And we have shown so far now we have two human subjects, uh, at least in our first subject, and, and other uh, our one subject, the other one is still just recently implant, implanted, so we haven't gotten there yet. But with our one human subject, together with uh, our colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, who have two human subjects, uh, at least, that have this implant in the somatosensory cortex as well, you stimulate and the subject reports feeling a little touch sensation on one of their fingers. It's remarkable. Yeah. It's, it's uh, and then, so then once you've got to that point, then what you can do is incorporate a, a prosthetic limb with uh, sensors on their, on the prosthetic limbs fingers that then yes. can then, um, you know, whose voltage is proportional to how much you're pressing down on it that that signal then gets sent to a encoder as opposed to a decoder yeah. an encoding an encoding algorithm which translates that voltage let's say that analog voltage signal into a set of pulses that stimulate the somatosensory cortex so 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 these people would have two uh, a site of recording and a site of stimulation at the same time exactly yeah. they do they currently yes. do yeah so that's so that's what we that's what we're doing now with our our colleagues at Pittsburgh. Yeah, we have two subjects. They have, uh, I, I believe, yeah, they have three subjects, and uh, with this, again, this bi-directional brain yeah. computer interface. Yeah, both motor and because you know, again, like I said previously, when I started out in this field, I didn't, I ignored sen uh, sensory feedback altogether. I said, well, I didn't think about it really. Yeah. And I, you know, I came to the conclusion that's it's it's a key component to fluid dexterous behavior. Right. That's a and that's a big leap from you know simply recording from the motor cortex. And if you think about that's a very simple mechanical problem of uh relative to this particular uh you know paradigm. Yes. Of controlling yeah, exactly. a 3D degree robot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so I think. So there again, those three problems: the the the, the implant device, the um, uh, the actual the 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 robotic device, whatever it is that you're controlling, that's more naturalistic, I think. And thirdly, the incorporating sensory feedback. Those those things again. There's nothing really hugely. A lot of it is engineering, I think. There's there is some neuroscience to especially on the proprioceptive side, like how are you going to provide that sense of, of, of kinesthesia? Yeah. That's still kind of mysterious how we're going to do that. So that's, yeah, that's a scientific mystery that hasn't fully been resolved, but the other aspects are kind of more engineering related. And I, I think that, uh, you know, someone like an Elon Musk, yeah. um, even though he promises way too much and is a, kind of has, um, ambitions that um, maybe may have they have certain ethical uh, concerns uh, but he has a lot of money yeah that's that's what has, we like in research I mean how much are we not able to do despite having the capabilities because of resources or or spending so much of time just to ask for those resources yeah, yeah. so I think I think um I mean, the people at, uh, from what I understand, the people at Neuralink are actually pretty smart people. Uh, he has some good people there. So, you know, I think that that might, he might end up doing something really practical. And, and now when, I don't know. Uh, he just got FDA approval recently yep. to implant his electrodes. Um, but he's got the resources, so he could he could really accelerate this. Yeah, in a way that we couldn't do twenty years ago, right, right, with the limited resources we had. Yeah. Let's let's hope for it. Uh, but what would be the uh, scope of this? Like, is this brain machine interface generally uh, related to movements, or 
do you think that there will be other aspects of cognition and perception action which the latitude for be... omaha nebraska is 41.2644 degrees north and its longitude is 96.0450 something alexa heard north. which uh thought we are calling her <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, uh talking about brain machine interfaces <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so, so what do you think like uh, are, are there uh, uh, domains beyond movement uh, and sensing oh, absolutely. movement yeah 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 well i mean um the other big area is vision uh artificial vision or visual prosthetics uh and uh, there are a number of groups trying to tackle that problem both um, at the level of the retina, putting in um, stimulating electrodes in the retina or in the visual cortex or in the intermediate area in the thalamus. Actually, my colleague uh, and one of my best friends, actually, that we've grown up together, uh, John Pizarres, who's at Mass, at Mass General Hospital, um, he's trying to develop a, a system that stimulates the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is the visual thalamus, which may be, I think might be like sort of the Goldilocks area to target for visual prosthetics. And so, so that's another area uh, which is still, I mean, although I think there may be, there's, there are companies out there like Second Sight, I think that they're trying to have, maybe even have things, devices approved. Uh, but they're very, they're kind of still very crude. Um, either, I think with retinal stimulation, uh, but they're, but anyway, those are going to advance. Uh, and then, um, well, I mean, I, I suppose the most successful device, uh, brain computer interface, kind of brain computer interface to date is the cochlear implant. Yeah. Uh, which is not really targeting the brain per se, but it's targeting the cochlea, uh, right. part of the nervous system. And uh, those have been implanted um, in thousands of people with great success. Yes. With people with uh, profound deafness. Um, so that's the big success story, I think, in the in the general field of brain-computer interfaces. So that's, that's our... That's our um, our goal. We're we're trying to head towards that uh, to a state where it's that successful. Um, yeah. And then, as far as cognition, I mean, the, the, yeah, I mean, that's still in its early days, but people are trying to develop, for example, an artificial hippocampus uh, to sort of improve memory or to incorporate memory or yeah improve or incorporate memory into the brain uh, th that's still very early stages um and then the other thing that you would i would still call it a brain computer interface is um various stimulating devices to help people with neurological disorders for example parkinson's disease yes Deep brain stimulators is is a is a brain computer interface. Yeah, um, and it's very successful as well. And it's very yeah. successful. Yeah. Um, and then people with epilepsy, uh, putting in stimulators, and also providing uh, a, a bidirectional system where whereby you record. You don't just stimulate; you record brain activity so that you can tailor the stimulation based on what the the state of the nervous system is in for example if you could record and predict the onset of a seizure you could then yeah. begin stimulating right. uh, to seize a seizure and there so, has been a lot of progress in that detection of seizures yeah yes exactly so and then there are other disorders um um for example psychiatric disorders with stimulation like um, um ocd obsessive compulsive disorder 
where they're stimulating in, in very severe cases that have shown promise. Um, so yeah, there, it's a it's a very exciting area, exciting time to be in this field. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but do you think this will also uh, reach, uh, you know, non-invasive uh, domain? Like, uh, non-invasive brain machine interface will also can also provide that kind of complexity at you. Like, not if not now, then in the future. Because one of the bigger hurdles is like, like who is willing to get an electrode, you know, implanted in the brain, right? Um, exactly. Like, That's you know, that. Yeah. That is the. $64,000 question. That's that's the big challenge right now because I don't see any way to do this non-invasively. You will not get the kind of precise targeting of areas non-invasively. Um, I think people are trying to develop minimally invasive systems. For example, um, there's a company, um, uh, Forget what the name of it is called but you know where they're actually trying to um, use the blood vessels uh, yeah. and and deliver electrodes miniature electrodes through the blood vessels that then come yeah. into the brain and then through the the membrane of the blood vessel record brain signals um through that blood vessel um and that's minimally invasive. That doesn't require a craniotomy. Um, and uh, yeah, I, there may be other approaches. I can't. I can't envision a completely non-invasive system that's really going to be practical. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and they, they they are, but they're mostly related to like hand movements, mostly like EMG based uh, processes, right? Uh, yeah, which have much lower resolution in general computers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Yeah. So, so what do, what do these uh, things tell about the science of uh, so so when you're talking about the, for example, incorporating sensory signals uh, improves uh, the fluidity. So, what has uh, what have brain machine interfaces? Uh, how have they changed uh, our understanding of the brain in terms of uh, the science of it? Uh, not from the engineering perspective, but from the basic understanding of the brain's perspective. Well, um, one thing we discovered recently, for example, um, is uh, it, it, it actually became a problem. It's a problem for us to address, but it, it, it taught us something important about the brain, which we already kind of knew already. But so when we stimulate somatosensory cortex, we get this percepts, right? Yeah. But at the same time, when you stimulate somatosensory cortex, you see effects in the motor cortex, presumably through synaptic connections between uh, somatosensory and motor cortex. And this is a problem for us because these cells in motor cortex are being used to uh, decode movement intent, but then they're being affected by the stimulation, and um, and that actually disrupts the decoding of movement intent that we're trying to do. So it actually it 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 makes de um, it makes the out decoding output worse when mm -hmm. we stimulate. Um, but that that was interesting because, I mean, it, again, we kind of knew it already, but the fact that S, somatosensory cortex and motor cortex are so intimately linked synaptically, yeah. um, there must be some reason for that biologically. Right. And and why is that now? Can we, instead of... Instead of making, instead of having this be a problem for us, maybe this is going to be something beneficial to us. But we haven't solved that problem yet. Yeah. So, so in a in an ideal system, when you're just recording from the brain of the monkey, mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, you don't feel, you don't get this issue because you're not stimulating and you, there's no feedback from the robot, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But in real life, when the monkey is actually moving the hand, you already have this feedback built in into those signals. 
And exactly. now the problem is that, you know, how to differentiate between these two, right? Yeah, because, exactly. Yeah. And it's not a simple thing. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so in the real system, yeah. when the monkey or the human is moving their limbs, yeah, somatosensory cortex is active. It's sending signals to motor cortex to presumably inform motor cortex how to maybe correct its movements or whatever. But so th th there should th there's some functional, presumably a, fun uh, a functional reason for that connection. But it's actually detrimental to our brain computer interface because when we stimulate it, it disrupts the brain signals from motor cortex. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that 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 makes sense because of course uh, uh, this is an artificial system which is not incorporating the the actual uh, yeah uh, reciprocal relationship you know which exists within the body yeah right 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 okay. so so that 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 was something. And through that work, we learned something scientifically, besides the fact that there's connections. Yeah. We also, we have this paper now under under review right now. We found that there seems to be a, um, a, ma a matching of somatotopic organization between motor cortex and somatosensory cortex, meaning the same body parts like the map of the body in somatosensory cortex, let's say the thumb area, yeah. ma maps to the thumb area of motor cortex. There's oh. a connection. So there's one to one. Yeah. Like more, more related to one to one mapping between somatosensory and motor. There's this one to there's one to one mapping between yeah. the thumb area to the thumb area of M1. And that was um that was kind of novel or that hasn't really been shown before yeah um and and so. is it is a rate of that a mapping in the sense uh that the intensity of that map is also uh, very similar or do you have uh overly like like difference in that mapping in terms of the intensity uh across the body uh, in intensity meaning what uh, do you mean by intensity I, I don't want to call it uh, uh okay so let's say proportional uh, the okay. proportional. I, will, I don't want to use the word representation for uh, yeah. To not mistake okay. it, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, the proportional representation, uh, representation in the sense of mapping, you know, rather than functional representation. Um. Well. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what you mean. I mean, so, what I guess what, like the map. The thing is, the map with the in the somatosensory cortex is very yeah. clear cut. It's there is a distinct area for the thumb, index finger, middle finger, and so forth. In motor cortex, it's less clear. If you like, if you go back to the early days when they yeah. mapped out motor cortex in humans, this was the work done by Penfield yeah. in human subjects. They stimulated in motor cortex and could evoke movements uh, by stimulating in motor cortex. And there, the map is not so clear cut. It's not clean. It's not a very, it's a very crude map. Like, for example, the thumb, you can evoke the thumb in various parts of the motor cortex. They're just uh, non-contiguous. Okay. Um, and whereas in, in, in S1, somatosensory cortex, it's much more clear, a clear and crisp map. So that's why it was kind of so. I mean, so the map is not the the sort of the sorry the the, the one to one mapping is not perfect because because the map in M one in motor cortex is not as per is not inherently very clean. Yeah. But but um, so that's why it was kind of surprising that we'd see anything like that because. I mean, some people say there's there's no real. I mean, listen at the, at a very crude level, there is a very strict uh, somatotopic map in M one. There's there's an, a region involved in the legs that's separate from the region involved with the arm, separate region involved with the mouth, and 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 the face. 
No question about that. No one disputes that. Yeah. But if you look within the arm area, there is not a strict map uh, of different body parts of the arm and hand. There isn't like, like I said, one localized region for the thumb, another one for the index finger. It's sort of in multi highly distributed, yeah. non-contiguous areas for the thumb for any part of the arm and hand, the wrist as well, the elbow as well, shoulder as well. So it's it's not so clean cut. And why do you think that might be the case uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the control of body? I think it's, this is speculation, but I think it's because um, you might want to set up when you're moving, I mean, um, you might want to create regions that, let's say, between the the thumb and the wrist, because they need to work synergistically, let's say. So you want those regions to be near each other and not, and then another local, another area where the thumb and, let's say, the third, the index finger, you, you need to find maybe create different kinds of synergies between different body parts for for movement for on the sensory side and movement is different uh, yeah i mean on the sensory side it's very clear cut you've got a 2d a 2d sheet of the skin right essentially the skin is a two dimensional and you're mapping yeah. that to a two dimensional surface on the cortex yeah it's so much that, yeah whereas in the motor, you've got, what do you have? You basically have a 2D sheet of motor cortex mapping to yeah. many degrees of many dimensions of mo movement, right. uh, whether, whether yeah. it's, you know, the different joints and stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's, not it's a topological problem. Yeah. It's a topological problem. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Right. Very different kind of projection you need. Exactly. Yeah. So, which also, which also means that uh, uh, finding that relationship, you know, in the, in the particle mapping and and movements would be much more difficult because who knows, you know, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, mathematically speaking, transformation might exist uh, in that topological between those two topological spaces compared to somatosensory. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I think it directly speaks yeah. to the degrees of freedom problem. Uh, yeah, Bernstein talked more in in the motor control perspective. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the other question I wanted to ask you was uh, regarding the basic science uh, is about what you're doing is in real time. So so the monkey is controlling the movements in real time. Uh, the decoders are acting in real time. And it does not capitalize much in terms of what we think the brain uh, like represents, whether it operates computationally, how close to a computer it is, right? you can be completely agnostic to any of these theories or any of the models or metaphors about the brain. And you can still be able to, uh, you know, understand how the movements are controlled uh, or at least, uh, you know, within uh, within the classification of those movements. And you're still able to make very efficient brain machine faces. Uh, but do you ever speculate on, on, uh, uh, on these ideas, whether brain is actually a symbol processing kind of system or it, it's actually computational or it actually uh, changes and represents and uh, deals with representations in the same way. Because encoding is a very different terminology, computer representation. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's, I, I, uh, yeah, the, the whole issue, the whole question of representation is something that I, I, I actually, I was the notion of a representation was challenged by me uh, to me yeah. back when I was in graduate school because I I was brought up by uh, my mentor my PhD mentor Bill Warren was part of uh, a a field in yeah. psychology called uh, ecological psychology and um, there they 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 argue there's no such thing as a representation yeah. 
I, I would say that, you know, there are, uh, they come in different flavors. I'm also a ecological psychologist in ways. And I was there yeah. with him, with Bill Warren, uh, in, the, in the ICPA conference in, in Mexico oh. uh, last month. Uh, oh. So, yeah. So, uh, and by the way, uh, we really have, we have a book uh, in press right now on affordances. Uh, oh. uh, so I've edited that it's, it will be coming soon where we talk about this. Oh. And there's a new one coming on brain compute, uh, computer metaphors. So the whole book is about representation. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, so uh, there are flavors now. I think now people acknowledge that uh, we don't mean, or Gibson did not mean that the brain cannot represent things. Uh, it's more like the representation is not the currency of its uh, working. You can have representation that some level, of course, we have memories and we have things. So there might be representation at some other base at some meta level, but representation is not the not how brains deals with things the way a lot of cognitive psychology uh, implies. It, it, yes. Yeah, I, I actually totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah it's a way to talk about it, yes. but it's not really how the brain works. Brain works. Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. And um um but it but I the question is the the other the other issue on the, the the on the other side of the coin you have you have representation and you also have computation yeah I think that I still believe that the brain is a computational device it's it's, uh. it's doing comp it's it's taking I think it's a useful way to think about it it's taking whether it's a neuron or a group of neurons they're taking inputs and from other sources, from other neurons, or from the periphery or whatever, and doing some changing, uh, doing making some kind of transformation on the inputs. Uh, but, uh, okay, so when you say transformation on inputs, uh, I mean, that can happen in multiple ways, right? Uh, but do you believe that it is doing computation in the sense of symbolic uh, no. or, or in a Turing, uh, not even Turing, I would say, in a Van Neumann uh, kind of architecture. No, no, right. no, not at all, not at all, not at all. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not, I'm not using computation in the, in the, the standard kind of computer, yeah, s s serial computer uh, that we have on our desks. Yeah. No, completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a more abstract notion. Yeah, it's, yes. it's. Yeah, I yes, I agree. Because with because that. in that sense, a lot of physical systems can compute. So I don't know whether you are aware of this work on yeast by Adam uh, by Adam Artsky. He has a, a group called uh, I think it's called uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name. It's it's more related to reservoir computing and concepts like that. Uh, and there, what they are finding is that when you look at yeast cells, collection of yeast cells, they actually have spike trains. It's just that the time span of those spike chain is much longer uh, because the the spike builds in across a much longer time compared to human neurons. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are also finding stable patterns in those. And uh, you can actually interpret it from very communications, Shannon's information perspectives in terms of information transfer from yeast, uh, collection of yeast cells to another collection of yeast cells. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Interesting. So... So the, now the next, the, so the question it raises is that what exactly, like, is is this, uh, are these spikes an emergent property of, uh, you know, chemical processing or actually chemical processing is a, uh, is a phenomena of, uh, it, so, so question I want to ask you is like, do you actually think that spikes, uh, the rest of the things are in service of the spikes or spikes mm -hmm. might, there's a possibility that yes, spikes are very informative, because they work as a proxy for other things, but spikes might be actually an epiphenomena of uh, I see. chemical process. Yes. Ah, uh, right. <laughs> and I'm asking you because you started with the axiom that spikes carry information yeah. and, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that axiom might be true uh, in both cases, when spikes are uh, epiphenomena as well as when spikes are actually uh, you know, what do everything? Yeah, I think, again, it's a way, it's shorthand for what actually is happening. It's, 
yeah, I mean, it's it, the spike is ultimately leading to the release of neurotransmitter, which then is picked up by uh, postsynaptic receptors, which then leads to a buildup of voltage. And all, yeah, so in that sense, it's a, it's an epiphenomenon. I don't really, yeah, spikes per se don't, it's, it's what we can measure. Yes. And we can talk about because we're, you know, we're recording from electrodes. I mean, if you're recording from electrodes, yeah. um, uh, you know, other, other systems like work with calcium imaging, you know, yes. so with calcium imaging, you're recording calcium signals. Right. Uh, and sometimes people try to infer spikes, spike timing from calcium signals, but you don't have to even do that. You could just say, you could just work with calcium signals and that and that's the way the brain communicates through calcium levels. And 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 you can decode movements and other properties yeah, from calcium absolutely. signals as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So okay. it's not necessary. Yeah, I agree. It's 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 the way I like to think about it. But yeah, it's just a, a shorthand. It may be an epiphenomenon. I I don't know. I'm not really sure, but it's it's it rep. Again, it's it's a shorthand for something, some underlying process that's happening that we yeah. understand. That's clear. It's clearly understood that one brain cell communicates with another one through a series of processes that result yes. in, um, you know, the transmembrane potential uh, voltage across the trans the membrane changes. It then re it releases calcium. I mean, then calcium influx enters the cell. Then that results in release of neurotransmitter, and and then is picked up by the postsynaptic cell. Yeah. Okay. And and what does the fact that a lot of brain regions you can control the arm from a lot of brain regions, right? It's not just it has to be motor cortex, right? So so what according to you does it tell about, uh, you know? Right. Right. About what exactly the neurons do, or uh, do we have like kind of a universal power to attune neurons to, you know, given enough time and constraints to like any sort of activity? Right. Yeah. Uh, well, it's definitely the the signals that we use to decode movements are highly distributed. You could see them in many places, but I think. Yeah. Um. I don't, yeah, I mean, there, yeah, I mean, there's, there's now things are, our understanding is, is gradually changing a little bit in, in neuroscience where we're seeing signals, like, for example, in visual cortex, we see signals having to do with locomotion of the animal locomoting, you know. That and so it's not just the visual input that's yeah. driving those cells, and so it's it's leading us to a new way of thinking about the brain that's it's highly interconnected, um, which we knew already it was highly interconnected. But I I wouldn't have, and people have almost I think they've demonstrated even visual cortex you can you know you can draw you can yeah. build a, a brain computer interface, so. Yeah, I, I I think our view is changing in the in neuroscience in general. The, the, I mean, there are there are regions. I, I that doesn't discount the fact that there are regions that are more highly no, specialized for certain yes. fun, certain yes. functions. Uh, but it's highly interconnected, and uh, you see evidence of these signals reflecting movement intent throughout the brain. Right. No, which 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 makes sense, and I don't think it's antithesis to anything. It, it's yeah. it's it's just more insightful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I remember some of your recent work goes even uh, even at the level of uh, uh, local fields. Uh, so, uh, oh, can you talk a little bit about that and what exactly? Uh, yeah. How has sure. it changing things and uh, you know making yeah. you more interested in those those aspects of more emergent aspects of activity well i i i've been interested for many years now with the local field potential because it it even though among many 
a certain segment of the neuroscience community, they they don't look at them favorably. They think it's, it's a waste of time studying those. And so what what is that? The, the local field potential is is a signal that you record from an electrode that it, it and the way you record it is by low pass filtering the signal. So you're actually not recording the spikes. You're recording you're filtering those out and and you're looking at another aspect of the signal, electrical signal. And and that is presumably it's believed to represent sort of the the aggregate synaptic potentials, subthreshold synaptic potentials local near the electrode tip. So it's an aggregate signal. It's like an it's like an EEG signal, but it's it's more local. It's more limited in its spatial extent. And um, the re one of the reasons I find it interesting to study is well, there are two reasons. One is um, I think sometimes if we just look at spikes, we're, you know, so typically we're going to record from one or two, maybe three neurons on one electrode. And then we have, let's say, 100 electrodes. So you're not, you're, again, sampling from much, you're, you're sampling maybe a, a couple of hundred neurons. It's very limited. The local field potential is sort of an, is a higher level sort of it's an aggregate signal that um, is not just one neuron near the electrode. It's It, it yeah. may represent more, uh, a, a large, a smaller, um, a, a collection of neurons near the electrode. Uh, and, and so I think it's sort of like a needle in a haystack question. You know, it's like we're maybe so focused too much on the needles, uh, you know, these individual neurons. Uh, but we... Again, my interest is in how large populations of neurons work together to create function. Um, so that's one reason. And the other thing is they, um, and this is something that I started, I think, yeah, basically over a decade ago uh, with these electrode arrays, we, I'm very much interested in space as well as time. So looking at the spatial relationships between electrodes and the signals. So we're looking at spatial information. Uh, and and what, what's nice about the local field potential is you can record that on every single electrode almost always. Whereas you can't, with the electrodes we are using, we can't always pick up spikes on every electrode. And you can pick up that even when the glial cells, you know, as a as a reaction to the foreign body, they have uncurved, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, course, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can record on every electrode. And so now you get a spatial, a nice spatial sampling of how that signal varies from one electrode to the other. And we've seen evidence of interesting spatial patterning, spatial temporal patterning, things like waves. So back in 2007, I think it was, we saw evidence of waves of activity uh, as measured with the local field that propagate across the motor cortex in a very stereotyped way. Um, we don't really know exactly what its function is, but um, you know, no one had ever seen that before, these waves of activity in the, um, yeah, uh, and then since that time, we've we've seen other patterns, again, kind of wave-like patterns that tell us something about when the animal is going to start moving and also what kind of movement they're going to make. So we can look at the direction of these wave-like patterns. From the direction of the wave-like patterns, we can decode what direct what movement the animal is going to make. So it can add a, a, a different dimension to the movements, uh, even for BCIs. Exactly, exactly. Another dimension, another yeah. way of uh, another way of looking at instead of just looking at spikes, yeah, and a collection of spikes, we look at the these patterns that are, emerge over a large group of neurons and electrodes, and and 
And I think that's super exciting. It's a comp it's a different way of looking at yes. information processing. I don't know. Right. And the fact that even emergent properties might have signatures of those uh, those integrated details. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and so where is the, it? Yeah. No, no go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, uh, you continue, please. No, I mean, that's just the direction we're heading in right now is we're, uh, we're continuing in that direction. We're looking at these large scale spatial temporal patterns, particularly space, looking at spatial patterning yeah. uh, across a large, re you know, well, relatively large region of, of cortex and how that that patterning tells us something about what the animals is doing. Right. And uh, where do you uh, where do you see like uh, the whole field moving in general? Like, if somebody starting their career in this field uh, now, uh, like where would they put their roots? Uh, well, I think uh, one one direction the field is heading in is um, well, I mean it, the field is big, but uh, you know, there's the whole um, transgenics that you can do with particularly with mice and other organisms not not so much with non-human primates um that uh, you know where you can manipulate the the genome to to really uh, address mechanism like how things actually and at a more molecular or granular level to understand um how a circuit works uh so you could you can um, engineer genetically engineer cells to express certain proteins that for example that fluoresce so you can image them so you yeah. can have them you can have only inhibitory neurons express a certain gene and so you can identify through optical imaging what are the inhibitory neurons doing versus the excitatory neurons um, which is hard to do with just electrophysiology. So that's that's exciting. And, and there's all sorts of things you can do, like opti optogenetics, where you stimulate optically certain cell types to disrupt the circuit. In a, so, and that will let you give you, presumably give you insights of how the mechanism works, how the circuit works. So that's one direction. That's not a direction i'm really heading in um uh, another the direction i'm one direction i'm heading in which i think is going to become more uh i think prevalent is looking at more natural behavior and reporting yeah. in the brain with natural behavior so we're we're doing experiments now with uh, marmosets um with wireless recordings where they're engaging in natural prey capture they're capturing real moths and real crickets. And uh, with wireless technology, they're not, they're not, they're not tethered, they're not um, constrained yeah. in any way. And we're not putting anything on their bodies to track their limbs. Uh, we're just using uh, new machine learning uh, algorithms to using cameras to track how the limb and the body moves. And, and we can also track the prey as well. And in these very natural settings, I think that's a direction you're going to see more of, as opposed to what's traditionally been done in behavioral neurophysiology, you know, from the beginning, very often was using very artificial behaviors um you know like when i started out you know we had we had our non-human primates you know play video games and yep. using a manipulandum and they were moving a cursor to a, a target and uh very artificial things um so i think that's a direction that's i think super exciting it's also a direction that's, uh you'll see also on the sensory side too presenting natural visual images as opposed to artifact not instead of just oriented edges yeah. or gabor functions or whatever showing natural images 
Right. Yeah. I think I, I think a lot of uh, the whole field of neuroscience in general is kind of more appreciative of natural stim, natural kind of yeah. scenes and you know uh, looking at behavior more. In, and there have been recent calls like you know John Krakauer's that uh, paper in neuron neuroscience needs behavior and uh, you know and and similar calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, so that, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's an exciting area for somebody a uh, young person, and and the technology is developed so you can. You know, you can study the the technology is there to be able to study the organism in its natural setting yeah. without interfering with it too much. Right. And right. record from the brain and record behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. that's uh, that's super exciting. Um, no, no, that's yeah. that's that's really wonderful. And I think I think a lot of uh, a lot of way uh, fields change is more. Uh, is less actually theoretical and philosophical, it's more technological because uh, you have the technological luxury now which you never had before. Oh, yeah. For example, wireless yeah, recording. Yeah. yeah, yeah, technology. Well, and starting with these electrode arrays, I mean, to yeah. be able to record, you know, historically, in the old days, you just record one neuron at a time. Uh, and then you'd move your electrode to a different place and then do the right. same and have the animal do the same behavior or, or present the vi same visual stimulus. Now you're going to record. So yeah, technology is driving a lot of this. Yes. This, uh, these new areas. I... Uh, 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 one other thing which I missed touching was uh, Michael Graziano's, uh, you know, findings of, of these uh, functional maps, right? So mm. those are wonderful findings which did not, you know, so if you think about like if there can be a signal, just a simple uh, signal uh, which can tell more about the trajectory or can just bring the hand towards the mouth, uh, you you don't need a lot of computational load which generally encoders have to uh, to completely guide the trajectory towards the mouth, right, from a particular spot uh, in space. So do you think that, uh, uh, are you aware of work which uh, Kind of replicated it in the brain machine interface domain and which could find uh, that kind of uh, ecological action maps uh, or ecological symmetry and sensory maps at a much higher level of organization uh, are you asking whether they're, they're being incorporated in bcis brain yeah. computer interfaces or, no not that no. i don't think there's any not not that i know of. nobody's really looking at that i um yeah well, of course, yeah, with Graziano's work, he was stimulating motor cortex. Yes. yes. With very high currents. Yes. With long I, I, I find that work fascinating, actually. Yeah. I, I don't I don't really know how to understand it as far as I mean a lot of people criticize it because they say you're basically hitting the brain with a hammer. Yeah. Uh and you don't really yeah. What do you learn from that? But I find it Interesting. I don't know, but it has not been it has not been incorporated in any way that I know but, of. But it gives a hint that uh maybe maybe at a different time scale, uh the the, the organization of movements might be a little different, right? Yes. Compared to yes. the time scales at which we record or we stimulate and we analyze. Yeah. Yes, yes. No, I agree with you. I agree with you there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm no, but no one has really looked at as incorporated that yet. I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe that will happen. Yeah. But. Well, I included that in one of the recent, uh, you know, uh, book chapters I wrote, and uh, that made me wonder. Uh, and I searched for brain computer interface uh, related to that, but couldn't find much. Uh, no. no. Yeah. yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's super interesting. Um, I'm not really sure exactly how to think about it exactly but yeah okay i mean there's another there's a there's there's a thought that's sort of been bubbling in my head for a long time which is that the motor cortex doesn't doesn't necessarily drive movement at at a very uh, fine time scale. We 
we see signals. If you record from brain cells in the motor cortex, you see information about detailed kinematics. Yeah. But but that may be just that may be partly due to sensory feedback. That is, it's it's also it's receiving information about yes. what the movement is doing. Yeah. As opposed to driving the movement. Um I, I've been thinking a lot, but I still haven't got a very clear idea of how how this would work. Whereas where the motor cortex is is maybe providing these um maybe along the lines of what Graziano's seeing, these sort of um I don't know. It, it, it's saying right. okay this is the kind of movement we want to generate kind yeah. of a very uh, an app more of an abstract movement and then it, it's almost triggering downstream areas to actually execute it yeah um, and, and it, it works more as a constraint in terms of uh yeah uh, like in terms of the global kind of synergy of the action yeah but but these things can be tested right if you have monkeys with uh uh, where you have uh, uh, sensory projections uh, kind of blocked uh, chemically or castrated, uh, these things can be tested, right? It's possible. That's tr yes, that is true. That's true. It could be tested, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm just thinking about our brain computer interface subjects. Um, there we are recording from the brain from the cortex and they're driving directly from that through a decoder to a, a a device yeah they're lacking okay aside from this experiments we're doing with tactile feedback but they're lacking any sensory feedback they're lacking a, a spinal cord that's a big thing yeah they're uh perhaps what they're doing is not quote unquote natural like the way the real system would work yeah they're not activating their brain cells and motor cortex the way they naturally would do yes uh, and even uh, the reflex even the reflexes are basically yeah. missing and when you even when you go back yeah. to the time of john dewey uh, the reflex arc concept uh you know even uh, i think spinal cord is a as a has a bigger big role to play than we actually attribute it generally speaking totally we t we we totally downplay its importance and i think it's yeah. it's a pro it's a mistake so um yeah so i don't know i'm starting to think about what we're doing with the bci i think it's super interesting and and yeah. we're learning things but it may not be without a spinal cord um without all the sensory feedback that's naturally available the way they're controlling devices is is a very unnatural way of doing things yeah it's functional i mean and I don't i'm not downplaying it. it's important yeah it will help people but Definitely. it's not the way the system really works yes yeah. yes <laughs> no no of course i mean we we have just started scratching the surface as, yeah. a, as a community so yeah yeah uh that that's wonderful uh uh well that was very insightful uh uh, Nico, uh, I really like the conversation, and I think we really dig 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 in a lot of stuff. Yeah, I I I really enjoyed it, and yeah, it was it was good conversation, and uh, you know, good luck on this this uh, thing you're doing here. Yeah, uh, more to come. Uh, uh, I mean, it it is kind of helping me uh, understand more as well as. Uh, uh, is creating a platform uh, for uh, you know science communication and uh, taking things you you know taking your insights uh, you know decades of work basically to people to digest a little in, uh, yeah. in a short span. Yeah, <laughs> good. And well, thanks. um, yeah, yeah sure. Um, and let's let's stay yeah. in touch. Let's yeah. stay in touch. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, good. Yeah, I'll see you later. Yeah, bye bye. Bye bye. bye.